Hmm. All right, hello everyone. So before we were going over the exam last time, uh, we, we had been starting to talk about membranes, membrane filtration, kind of as a follow-up to granular filtration. So we're going to pick back up there today. We've talked a little bit about the different uh, membrane systems. We've got hollow fi fiber, uh, tubular, flat sheet. I really just kind of discussed overall what, it, what makes a membrane, how do we use it, what does it look like in practice. Um, and then we worked this example problem, and I recommended you try uh, doing the same thing but adjusting the percent removal as a, a way to take a look at the system if it was a little bit different. Uh, so today we're going to get back to it with a little bit more focus on uh, kind of the math of how effic efficient they are, how effective, how much water we're retaining, um, what's the deal with transmembrane pressure, uh, the pressure requirement to drive water across the membrane, some things like that. Okay, so that, <clears throat> that'll be, um, so if you were looking online, we've, I've got two PowerPoint slides posted now, um, one we did last time, and then here's uh, today's. Okay, so as we think about the effectiveness of a membrane, uh, well, actually, you know, before we get further, uh, let me just say real quick that um, for the exam right now, we have the exam, the next exam scheduled for November 3rd. I'm checking with uh, one of the other faculty about an exam that was uh, directly before ours last time. Try to avoid that scheduling. So there's a chance I'll move that to the 29th. Right now, we're currently planning on going over the Flint water crisis. So the 29th is a uh, so October 29th is a Thursday, November 3rd is a Tuesday. Our syllabus uh, currently has our second exam on November 3rd. Um, so I'll let you know soon about that if I update it. Um, and if you have particular concerns about one day or the other, feel free to let me know. I'll try to take, into, take them into account. Um, my default will be to keep with the syllabus, but I'm just going to try to avoid that, that same problem if we can. Uh, on that note, we still have a decent amount of time, so I'll, I'll be assigning a homework probably um, at the end of this week, or maybe at the beginning of next, so that you have at least a week to work on that, and then we'll go over that before the exam. Um, and that'll, that homework will essentially cover both filtration types and disinfection, and those will be the, the topics for the exam. OK, so unless there's any questions about that or immediate concerns, we'll go ahead and get back to uh, membrane filtration. OK, so as I was saying, we talked a bit about them, what it is, what they look like, how we use them. So now we want to take a look at you know, their effectiveness. So we'll, we'll start with kind of a solute basis. OK, how do we describe mathematically how much, um, how much stuff we're removing, given that we have maybe some sort of a particle or uh, other solute, something dissolved in water, that we're trying to remove um, with our filtration process. Um, pardon me a moment. It looks like I don't have a cursor. I don't have my normal pen cursor. There it is. Okay. All right, so for, for the effectiveness, there's going to be a lot of R's. I'm keeping consistent with the, that book that I recommended as a, an additional resource for the membrane chapter. I'm trying to stick with their um, nomenclature and their, um, their symbols and everything. So I, I do apologize up front. There's going to be a lot of R's. The fact that I've typed them, I hope, will help. And this is going to be the way they appear on your formula sheet as well. So capital R is going to be our fraction rejected. Uh, so this uppercase R, no subscript. This fraction rejected is going to be 1 minus the fraction here that got through. That's fairly obvious, but the CP is the concentration in the permeate. So if we have some sort of membrane system, just draw the little 
box diagram here. So we have water going through the membrane, passes through, some of it's rejected by the membrane, and so we have a flow here that's our retentate, QR, got the feed flow, and then our permeate flow. So given these different flows, each with their own concentration, so we have a concentration in the feed, a concentration in the retentate, and a concentration in the permeate. So given that, the fraction that we reject in terms of the fraction of uh, contaminant or solute, whatever we're working with, that fraction is going to be 1 minus the amount that gets through. So CP, CP over CF, that's the fraction that escapes or that goes through. Um, so I'll write this here. Okay, so one minus that, you know, it, it's we're dealing with fractions, so one is, you know, 100%, zero is, or, you know, 0.1 would be um, 10%. So the fraction that passes through, then, you know, one minus that is going to be our fraction rejected. So we've seen systems like that. It's pretty straightforward. We're going to be dealing with something like milligrams per liter. Uh, it doesn't have to be in a mass units necessarily. Um, could be a number of bacterial cells, could be um, moles of some large ion, um, some sort of concentration, and milligrams per liter is an example. We can also take a look at this fraction on a log basis, similar to how we do sometimes with disinfection and uh, biological um, counting. So our log then would be the log fraction removed. So at that would simply be the log of the CF, so the concentration in the feed, divided by the concentration in the permeate. So that, right there, CF over CP, that's going to be what we started with divided by what we ended with. So sort of N over N naught, in a way, or C over C naught, if we're kind of relating it to some other systems. So what that's going to give us is Typically, you know, if the membrane is actually doing something, then CF will be smaller than CP. So if, there, if the membrane is actually functioning, we can expect CF to be smaller than CP. That means this fraction here is going to be less than 1. And if we take the log of something that's less than 1, you know, we, we have some idea of what's what the outcome is going to be on the other other side. Okay, so if we do this, we say, as an example to compare R versus R log, uh, let's describe 99.99% of algae removed, like we did in that problem the other day. So in, in some continuous flow system where we have a concentration and all that. So R, just to leave it as R, would be, okay, this is 1 minus 1 over 10,000. And that's the equation right here put into practice, right? So if we, we can just say that the CP, the amount going through versus the amount um, in the feed, that's 1 over 1,000 because we're removing 99.99%. So, you know, you could fill in the actual numbers here. Maybe it's um, 153 here and then 10,000 times that on the bottom. The point being we're removing 99.99%. Okay, so then to write that out, that's 0.99999. And you have to make sure you get the right number of nines there. An easier way to represent that would be the R log, where this is just log of 10,000. And I, I uh, misspoke there. That was I said that completely backwards. That makes more sense now. So obviously, I, I was saying the right thing, but just backwards, right? So CF should be bigger than CP because the membrane's rejecting stuff. So there's going to be less in the permeate than there is in the feet. Okay, so that means, and that's why it wasn't making sense in my head, 
and now it makes sense. So we have something that's greater than one, and that means you know our value over here um, is also going to be uh, positive. So log of 10,000 is four, because 10 to the fourth is 10,000. So that gives us that four log removal. Uh, sorry about that confusion there. Okay, so pretty basic. We, we've done essentially this before. We've uh, looked at stuff like this. Um, so that's just a kind of a shorthand. Um, and like always, what I suggest you do is familiarize yourself with these formulas that are on the um, formula sheet for you. Understand what these parameters are, where you might be getting them, how to work with them, um, so that you're comfortable in case in case you need to use them. It's not um, super complicated outside of that. Okay, so we can look at the efficiency of a membrane as well. Uh, so that was kind of the effectiveness in terms of how much of a solute we can remove. Well, we can look at the efficiency of how much water we're keeping through the process. So on a kind of a water balance, we have lowercase r as our recovery or recovery rate. And this um, again is going to be a fraction. Essentially, it's the fraction of water that we end up keeping as clean, usable water compared to how much we um, we took from our stream or whatever um, for the purpose of producing clean water. So this is going to be, we can think of it as clean or treated over the total used. Um, we'll just write it that way. So maybe you're pulling water out of a stream and you're filtering it and then you know maybe 80 percent of that water you pull out of that stream actually becomes useful drinking water and then the remaining 20 percent uh, is now dirtier than it started and has to be treated as wastewater. So in terms of managing your withdrawals from a stream or other water source uh, this becomes important um, and also just simply to know how much water you're producing. So in the, and this is in flow rate, so this is QP, so that Q of the permeate divided by the Q in the f um, of the feed flow rate. Cubic meters per second would be a you know a typical way to express this. Uh, liters per minute would be fine. Just depends on the system. And here I'll just remind you that in a system like this, our our flow rates are going to be additive to the total, right? So our in our system we really just have a feed flow. A permeate and some amount rejected. And given that we're conserving water, we, we have the simple relationship here. Okay, so as in a, a quick example, we've got a system treating a 100 liters per minute of water, 15% of it goes to waste. What is our R? Well, we can put in those numbers. So, you know, if 15 is wasted, that means we have 85 left in the permeate. 85 over 100 is 0.85. So that's our um, essentially a 85% recovery rate, or a, our R value is 0.85. And you see here one, you know, really simple thing that had to be done here was we converted from this 15% uh, wasted based on this um, you know, basic assumption here that that 15 liters per minute would have to go in that QR, right? So that means we're left with 85 for QP. So it sounds pretty straightforward and simple when I just say it like that and we're just talking about it, but you know, on a you know, assignment or an exam, um, keep in mind that you do have to um, make that relationship uh, for things, cases like these. Okay. Okay, so the next, next thing I want to talk about is the flux. So we talked a lot about um, this concept during granular filtration. Um, a lot of our discussion was about 
okay, how much water are we getting if we pass through some area of the filter? And in that case, it was a filter bed. The same principles applying, right? We have water going through it at some velocity or some flux, but it's essentially a flow rate through an area. So you can express this as meters per second, or it could be cubic meters per square meter per second, or it can be some other units like liters per square meter per minute. You know, the, the point here is that we've got um, volume per area per time. Okay, so, you know, typical in membrane, membrane filtration, it is a little more typical to use something like liters per square meter per hour rather than just give a, a velocity term. But if you were to look at the water flowing through this system right at the surface, you could call that a velocity. Um, and that, that would be true. The, the speed of water traveling um, in that direction through the membrane um, would be a velocity, would be the velocity of the water at that point. Um, so that, that would still be an accurate way to say it and some, something you could actually say, okay, hey, look, the water is traveling literally at this speed um, in, that, in that spot. And you could know that if you know the flux and the, uh, um, yeah, if you knew the flux. Okay, so how do we define, define flux? That's, like I just said, that flow rate, Q, divided by the area of the membrane. Uh, in this case, the area of the membrane gets a little bit more uh, interesting than in our granular filters. It's not just simply a length times width. You know, we have the spiral bound, we have flat sheets that are bent, we have all sorts of membrane forms. So this is, um, uh, this is a, a system where we have a little bit more uh, complication going on. So, sorry, I kept that spot on the slides one second. I'm gonna fix that. I have one question about what you said with the flux and the velocity. You said you could use it to find velocity. Is that correct? So the question is, uh, for, for those watching, um, we can find, can we find the velocity from the flux? Is that what I said? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, if you know the flux, then you essentially know the velocity right there because it's, it's going to be the same thing. So let's say you have this is your membrane surface. You have water. It's flowing towards it. Some of the water is, you know, going to go to the side. That's whatever is rejected. But you're also going to have a flow going through. And we're going to assume that that's going to be, you know, if you take a look at, um, you know, velocity is a vector. So you're taking a look at the velocity this way um, through the membrane. If you know the flux, um, that's going to have already given you this uh, volume per square per area per time. So you might have to adjust for the the units. So if it's in liters per square meter per minute, that's not velocity units. So you might have to convert that liters to cubic meters, but then you've got it. Um, so that value. Um, given the right units will be will be your velocity term at that velocity term at the surface in that direction right that's not saying anything about the velocity you know in this direction in this problem so it's going to be determine example. the velocity of the, of the fluid that's permeating the membrane is what you're saying yeah and and you can think about it as like right at the surface there once you get into the membrane itself the membrane structure is kind of complicated and flow through that porous media is going to be a little different. Um, so that's probably important to understand some concepts we'll talk about in a few minutes, um, kind of at a, a deeper level, design of membranes, things like that. But um, certainly as it's coming into the pores, that's, that's the velocity there. Okay, that's a great question. So the question is, the flux, is that um, based on QF or QP? 
Uh, yeah, and I should have um, done that here. The flux um, across the membrane is, is a very good question. I will, yeah, I might actually take the PowerPoint down just to revise that here in a moment as well. That is the flow rate going through the membrane. Um, so it's a, you know, we have the Q feed over here and this amount of water going through is the amount permeating and whatever is not, you know, in this example is the retentate. So in order to know, to, to have this volume of water that's going through the membrane, we do have to use the QP. Uh, that is a, a very important point. Thank you. I, I have forgotten too many times to clarify that and I'm going to do so right now. Um, just adjust that to the equation here. There we go. So that QP uh, is very important. And again, thanks for the, that question. OK. Otherwise, it's very much like our granular filters. Um, in that case, there was no uh, QR. So it was, in that case, it was very simple. QF was QP for the granular filters. Um, Okay, so here's an example, um, and this is going to be something that really uh, takes a look at that surface area, so I'll come back to this in just a moment. The, one of the big important factors of working with flux is simply understanding that surface area, how much do we have or how much do we need. That'll tell us how many membrane modules or how big of a membrane we need to do our, um, to design a system to do what we need it to do. OK, so for this problem, it's from that uh, book chapter that I, I showed you guys. It, we're essentially going to compare an outside-in versus an inside-out filtration module. So we have uh, this Dow um, membrane module that contains 5,760 fibers. So this is a hollow fiber system. We've got a large case with 5,000 little tubes all running through it. Each of these are little membranes. So that's kind of the system or the setup. Then each of those individual fibers we can look at as a hollow tube membrane. And so if you remember the way we look at that is we have kind of a tubular membrane, and we can look at it with operating outside in or inside out. All right, so I'm going to finish drawing, finish reading and, and drawing the problem first. Okay, so the fibers are 1.87 meters long. That's not a very good drawing there. Um, so these guys... Something like this. This is 1.87 meters. And you see here, I haven't even finished reading the problem that I'm drawing it out. I, I recommend drawing as early as you can in a problem to make sure you understand what's happening. Then the outer diameter there is 1.3 millimeters. So we could, in our drawing over here, say that is 1.3 millimeters. Note that we've got meters and millimeters, so we're going to need that conversion. Then we've got this uh, inside diameter. We'll say it looks like about there to here on my drawing. And this is 0 0.7 millimeters. OK, then it says calculate the water production from one module if the flux is 75 liters per square meter per hour. So 
our flux is given liters per square meter per hour. And the flow direction in case number one is outside in. Outside in. And two is inside out. And then we're asked to compare the two answers. Okay. So, a couple things here. It's asked us to calculate the water production. Um, water production, you know, we don't, we haven't specifically said what that term means. I would assume when I see that, we're talking about either a volume, uh, if given some amount of time, or more likely a net flow rate, right? And that would make sense given <coughs> we have a flux, um, we have a problem that's set up so that we can decide what the surface area of these membranes are, and what we're looking for is essentially that water production is going to be that flux times a surface area which gives us a flow rate. So that'll be QP essentially. All right, so I'm going to give you a few minutes to, to take a look at this. Um, before, I, before I do, let me draw one more thing as, as you're thinking about it. Um, if we're doing filtration from the outside in, our active separation layer is going to be on the outside of the membrane. Well, I talked about this a little bit last time we were discussing it, but for the outside in case, that's going to be our, our surface that we're using for the separation. And I'm going to bisect this so we can just take a look at the kind of the two examples on one on one page here. Yeah, draw that a little better. So if we're just taking a look at this kind of in half. Uh, so we can take a look at the two ways. That would be one of them. And then if we're doing inside out, the flow is coming from the inside. And this layer here on the surface of this membrane is going to be the um, separation layer. So that in purple here would be the inside to out. That's just um, physically what's going to happen. You know, if, if we have if we're able to separate on either either way, you know, which usually the membranes would be designed one way or the other. Um, so as we decide which type we want, uh, which type will be acceptable, that's kind of the parameter. Are we looking at that outer diameter or the inner diameter? All right, so take a few minutes um, to work on that. do a good job on this because I don't have the solutions written out with me today. <clears throat> that way you can you can fact check me as I work through it with you. In a minute.
so let's take a look at this uh, first one here, um, just to finding the surface area for the outside in, which was the, uh, the first problem. Um, in order to find that surface area, we need essentially that length times the circumference. That'll be our surface area of the cylinder. That should be 1.87 meters times uh, 2 pi r is the um, formula for that, right? So that would be pi d. Or is that 2 pi d? Blanking. 2 pi r. 2 pi r, good. Okay. And then we also need to keep in mind that one membrane module contains 5,760 fibers. So when the question is asking us from one module, that's talking about one, one module containing all of those fibers. So that's, that's what brings our surface area from something like 0 0.007 meters to um, this 43.99 meter square meters. If I if I've done the calculator correctly, can somebody double check that? Just using this. Great. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. So then, for this one, we would just need to say the flow. Then uh, that water production that's going to be 43.99 square meters times 75 liters per square meter per hour. So when we do that, it should be this times 75. So that should give us um, basically 3,300 liters per hour. Then we do the same thing for the, the next one. It's uh, essentially the same process. So I'll type that up here real quick, and you can double check my answer. surface area I got was 23.69 so we'll just say 23.7 square meters multiply that by the flux and we get 1776 round up to seven. Okay, so that would be the uh, two water production values. And then the last little bit of the problem asks us to compare the two values. So you could um, just take really either of these and divide it by the other and say, okay, well, this one is that much, you know, that percent better or more effective than the other. So doesn't specify how to compare them, just that you are supposed to compare them. So we'll just divide this guy by 3299 and say, OK, well, um, the inside out is, is providing 54% you know, uh, of the flow that the outside in produces. So however you want to compare them um, is fine. And that shows you the importance of um, operating uh, or deciding whether to be outside in or inside out. Now, there may be other factors that you would actually consider in practice um, in terms of how the membranes need to be situated, but that's, um, that's a good example.
Uh, and again, the, a lot of these problems are going to be uh, geometry problems or otherwise kind of mass balance type problems. We're not, in membrane separation stuff, we're not dealing with rates and um, complicated rate equations or, and really the, the mass balance type stuff is quite simple. We just are taking a look at okay, what's affecting the flux, things like that. Okay, so speaking of, uh, next I'd like to talk about the, the pressure or the driving force to make, um, make things happen, cause water to go through the membrane. Um, and the way we refer to the pressure is transmembrane pressure, because really we're looking at a pressure drop from, if we have some membrane and water over here has some pressure, and we have, so the pressure, let's say, in the feed and a pressure on the permeate side, um, we're really driving water through with a, a pressure gradient, right? There's higher pressure over here on the left in that, in that water compared to the right. Uh, actually, I'm, I think I'll draw this a little differently. So let's imagine we have um, some flow coming through into a membrane and coming out of that membrane. So the feed versus the permeate here, that's gonna be our pressure drop across the membrane. That's our transmembrane pressure. So pressure in the feed minus pressure in the um, permeate. And the reason we might have a pressure in the permeate is because a lot of times we actually operate membranes in series. So we, we may have a, a second membrane after that. If we're not getting or don't care to get complete rejection of our stuff, a lot of times we'll actually start off with um, very crude filters that are just catching larger particles and step upwards and upwards until we get to a, um, a very fine, um, fine mesh, you know, nanofiltration, something like that. Um, or just simply repetitions of the same one. And so we might have more of these uh, in a series. But the point here is that this would be I guess we would call it the the permeate here, but it would also then be the the feed number two, and the same would be this one, right? So this would be permeate two or pressure in the feed for the third one. Um, however, you want to express that, you, you see what's happening, right? It's a uh, you have some pressure drop across this mem membrane to the next, and from this mem membrane to the next, and ultimately you know, maybe you have atmospheric pressure over here when you discharge it into a, um, some container that it's, it's at atmospheric pressure. So then you can, you can kind of think of this as uh, how would you pressurize this entire system and, you know, what pressure can a given membrane handle? Well, you know, you need really high pressure for something like ultrafiltrate or uh, nanofiltration or reverse osmosis. You don't need that for something like microfiltration. Uh, but the deal is you're not going to have a big tr pressure drop across the membrane if it doesn't need it. So if you're applying a huge amount of pressure um, to a basically a screen mesh, all of that pressure just about is carrying through. And so your pressure drop, especially if we have, let's say, microfiltration here, and then um, we'll say um, ultrafiltration, I'll call it mu f here, and then nanofiltration. If that's our deal, then we might have like 0.1 drop, and then a 10 drop, and then a, you know, 1,000 drop of whatever pressure units we're using. So it doesn't matter so much, um, you know, that means we're applying a total pressure of 1,011, essentially, or even less than that, 1,010.1. The, the point is that if you're applying this uh, that huge amount of pressure up front, you're still going to have, you know, 1,000 minus that 0.1 for the second step, right? So that pressure, and in terms of the membrane design, they're rated for that transmembrane pressure. They're not rated for 
the uh, total pressure in the system because they're they're really just um, rated based on how much uh, pressure they're essentially resisting. Okay, so I hope that wasn't uh, confusing there. Oops. Um, the point was just simply that um, the way the way we look at pressure. You know, in it, in a system like this, it steps. You know, it steps down. Whereas if we had a system where it was in parallel, you'd have to just add more pressure to apply that to both, um, both systems. So if you were doing it this way, this would be in parallel. Your pressure here. Um, you know, you essentially have the same same drop on both sides, and you don't have to add more pressure, but the same same amount of pressure this system um, will be applied to both sides. Okay, so uh, coming back to discussing TMP itself, so I mentioned TMPs that feed minus the permeate. Usually, we're dealing with Pascal's. I'll probably keep it in those terms for you for the class. And the way this relates to a flux is essentially our flux is going to be equal to, and we took a look at a flux equation earlier, so we could relate this one to that one if we wanted. Um, but one relation would be the that TMP, the transmembrane pressure, divided by R sub T, which is the total membrane resistance, total resistance of the membrane, times the dynamic viscosity of water. So here we're introducing this resistance value. I was talking about this a moment ago where if we have um, some really tight membrane that's uh, like a nano or os uh, reverse osmosis membrane, um, that's going to have a lot of built-in resistance to the water because the pores are so small. It's going to depend on the viscosity. So if you've ever, if you can imagine taking like a uh, a window screen and pouring water through it, it should go right through. Try pouring honey through it, you can kind of visualize that in your brain that, oh, that honey is probably going to have more, encounter more resistance to flowing through it. Um, you know, even, you know, that'll be more of an impact than just the fact that honey drips more slowly, right? It'll, it'll be slowed down even worse trying to get through um, even reasonably large pores. So that viscosity term then um, is pretty important not only if we try to filter some other uh, fluid but particularly for temperature dependence um, water is uh, has different viscosity based on different temperatures actually a uh, classmate of mine in grad school was doing a master's project on using ceramic membranes to filter hot water coming off of um, I think it was coal-fired uh, power plant systems where they have uh, lots of fly ash stuff caught in a, a waste stream that was heated pretty hot and the cool thing about ceramic membranes is that they can withstand the heat so he was looking at okay well what happens with um, that type of a system where you can actually get a much lower viscosity of water because it's a, a hot and pressurized water so it's kind of an an interesting system there um, Typically, it's just going to matter in terms of uh, the relevance to, um, you know, is it winter, is it summer, what's, what's that going to do to our um, operation. Okay, so this RT, um, I said this is total resistance, this is in per meter units. So if we take a look at this, if the transmembrane pressure is in pascals, divide that by this per meter and mu is kilogram per meter second. That's going to end up being um, kilograms per square meter second on the bottom here. And Pascal's, um, it's, um, I'm forgetting the, uh, the exact unit right now, but it relates to Newtons, and we know those are meters and kilograms. It's like Newton per square meter. Newton per square meter. Um, yeah, that, that sounds exactly right. And then that would... Um, 
those square meters I think would then cancel and stuff. We can go into that, but ultimately it should end up giving us the flux, um, the flux units here. Okay, uh, and this is just an example here. It doesn't have to be in hours. Um, in fact, given that we're dealing with Pascals, um, this might change. My point, my point in just putting this here was um, this is flux units. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit more about the resistance term. Um, and as we get into that, um, I want to just show a few pictures found. If you Google uh, membrane filters, uh, these are scanning electron microscope images of cross sections of membranes. And what you'll see is a typical membrane, and I think I mentioned this in the past, has a supporting layer that's not meant to do the filtration, but it's meant to be something you can build the filtration layer onto and give some uh, sturdiness to the to the membrane so you'll see almost almost all of these cases have kind of this large porous area um, that allows water to flow pretty much freely through it and then some tightly compact layer where the separation is designed to happen um, so we see that in this case um, here's another case where this upper area here is the kind of the filtration layer and the rest of it's that more freely flowing area. Uh, here's a diagram and it kind of, if I were to zoom in, it would tell us, you know, this is kind of a, the membrane support layer here. It's quite porous. Uh, this would be the filtration layer. And then this was, I think, some sort of a, just a cloth mesh or something that's um, the support layer was put on top of. So you'll see that in almost all the membranes. Uh, another pretty clear example here. And as we start looking with finer and finer uh, visualization tools, you could get down and see, okay, well, exactly how big is the typical pore size in this surface? We call the that typical pore size, we call that nominal, the nominal pore size of a membrane. In reality, there's all sorts of pores in something like this. Uh, even our fanciest techniques, um, you know, we can get pretty good control over how big these pores are, but it's going to be, uh, it's not going to be like a standardized where, you know, unless it's a, a very large pore size membrane, maybe we can, but typically it's not going to be a very st standardized, okay, we're just punching this this into each spot and making a uniform hole. Uh, it's going to be some some interesting process that creates a bunch of holes and then we have some way of confirming testing that on average they're about this size and we're rejecting you know some uh, some fraction that's sufficient to say okay this is this membrane is good we're rejecting this amount of particles above this size. Okay so if you consider this then uh, the membrane resistance uh, to these guys, well, one thing you'll see is if you have a really, really tightly compact system, you're usually going to be needing higher pressure, and you're also going to need a support layer that's a little bit, um, it's not too large compared to that, that layer that you're supporting. So over here, we can imagine maybe a bit larger pores in that surface layer. Um, probably less pressure than something like this membrane can handle because these are, you know, and maybe the scale is just different and I'm uh, misreading this, but you kind of get the idea that you're going to need a, a pretty strong support system to support a high pressure um, membrane. And you can see that as you have smaller and smaller pores and the distance that water has to travel through that separation layer, those are the types of things that are going to affect our membrane resistance. So we're going to talk about membrane resistance um, with a few things in mind. Um, so it's a, again, the units for membrane resistance are per distance, so per meters here. And we're going to say that membrane resistance is effectively the, or the total resistance rather, is effectively just that membrane resistance plus a phalant resistance 
plus a cake layer resistance. Okay, so we were just looking at several membranes and what I'll do here is I'll say we have a separation layer like right at this this boundary here is our separation layer. And we've got some sort of support system I'll just sort of uh, draw a diagram here just just showing that we've got pores that are opening bigger uh, kind of away from away from that system I don't know if this will actually work visually but um, you get the idea what I'm basically depicting a cross-section where we have the open pores here and the tighter net pores at that surface on the right so this would be our separation layer and this this is our uh, support okay so when I talk about the the membrane resistance um, that's just inherent to the membrane so this is just based on the membrane itself and so I'm going to draw a little red squiggle here because that's how I showed that separation layer through here it's just kind of red squiggle stuff okay so the resistance for water passing through those pores that's the portion that's RM then we would also have a fallant resistance so RF this is going to be Valence that have gotten inside the membrane and are coating the internal pores. And so these are going to be accumulating within the membrane itself. And honestly, it would be probably a better, a better way to look at it would be to get to the point where we're showing this phalant reaching inside the pore structure of the separation layer, because that's where it's really going to matter. But visually, I haven't, you know, zoomed it in quite that far. So um, I'm going to erase that just for now. Um, so th this stuff would be clogging the pores along with the, you know, the separation pores. And it would just be coating all the other internal membrane surfaces, adding some resistance to flow as water tries to go through. So that's the that blue stuff there. And lastly, we'll add a green layer here. Actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw these as little spheres. So a cake layer resistance is um, essentially what happens when we have a layer of particles and phalanx that start accumulating at the surface um, on top of the membrane surface to the point where uh, we're forming what we call a cake layer. So as you might imagine, when we have more and more of this stuff building up, it's going to actually create its own membrane in a way where it has, you know, there are pores that water can pass through uh, within this cake layer, um, but it's not going to be very easy. So as we consider water passing through at this point, you know, water is going to have to go through that and the pores themselves to get there. So in total, the, the total resistance then is a resistance added by the, this cake layer plus the resistance of the membrane itself plus that resistance that's added from the um, phalant stuff that's inside the pores. Okay, so it really, it doesn't matter too much about, you know, where it's coming from. It's just that it's resistance and it's summed up to a total. And you can calculate, okay, given some amount of resistance that was observed, and, you know, you could do experiments to observe this. Um, so it'll probably give you some number or ask you what must be that number if, if we had to increase the pressure this amount. Okay, how much did the total resistance increase? If we knew part of that was the phalant resistance, how much of the remaining should be the cake layer? You know, it would be a, a pretty straightforward problem. 
and I'm not going to have you go and do experiments to test this yourselves, but this gives you an idea of how, how membrane filtration operates in terms of how it becomes, um, how we, we start having to apply more and more pressure, kind of like the granular filtration case, and why it's important to clean. So uh, membrane cleaning then is, is important, but it happens kind of in a different manner than um, granular filtration. You might backwash, but it, it usually only takes um, a brief amount of time. A lot of times what you'll do is you'll maybe operate for a, a minute and then five seconds it'll stop uh, pulling water through and it'll just shake that membrane. Um, and that'll it'll do like a cycle on kind of a, you know, tens of minutes, thing like that. And then in a few, few months you might expose the system to chemical cleaning. So uh, whereas for, for the cake layer, um, you might have some physical agitation to get rid of the cake layer. And this, you know, it de really depends on the type of membrane you're using and the setup and what op options are available. Um, but something like physical agitation um, on the order of, you know, every, I don't know, 20 minutes or something. This is just an example. Um, that would do well at eliminating the cake layer. Um, so dealing with the cake layer. And then for the phalant resistance, um, you might do a chemical cleaning something like twice a year. So these are, by the way, examples I'm, I'm using off the top of my head from a, what's called a membrane bioreactor um, that I, I had a chance to work with a little bit. Um, that system, it's microfiltration, it's submerged membranes in pretty nasty wastewater stuff, and it's withdrawing water continuously, and then every few seconds or every few minutes or whatever, it um, is stopping and just shaking the membranes. It's also applying, as we'll learn about um, activated sludge system, it's applying lots of bubbles, which also kind of help that process in that particular case. So it does that shaking every um, 20 minutes or something like that, it helps get rid of that cake layer. And then they chemically cleaned it about twice a year um, to really restore the membrane's function um, from that fouling resistance part. So just wanted to give those this kind of uh, general idea of how it works. Um, hopefully that paints a bit of a picture in terms of what's happening on the, the inside of these membranes. So would you say the cake layer is composed mostly of like the particles that's trying to be filtered out? It's kind of forming over the... Yeah, so the question is, would I say the, the cake layer is formed mostly on the particles that we're trying to filter out. Yeah, that's that's essentially correct. Um, sometimes we might have something a little more complex than just particles. Um, maybe we have um, some chemicals that are precipitating, some um, minerals that are precipitating, or uh, organic molecules that are um, kind of sticking to one another and starting to um, form solids that where otherwise they were uh, dissolved. And another important part is actually bacteria growth. So most, most water, especially if we're trying to filter it, um, it's pretty likely that it's going to have some bacteria. And then as we start accumulating the particles and the other stuff, it makes pretty good bacterial food. Bacteria are about that scale. They're probably getting filtered. So bacteria can actually uh, colonize the surface and be part of that cake layer as well. Um, so that's a good question, and uh, you're exactly right there. All right. So last thing I wanted to talk about, and also certainly happy to answer more questions along that line if there are any. Um, membrane permeability. So the relationship between the flux that we're achieving and the pressure that we're applying. Uh, we call this... Uh, permeability, so L underscore P. 
So that's our membrane permeability. This is just simply going to be the um, ratio of flux to transmembrane pressure. And if you do those units, that's going to end up giving us a square meter second per kilogram, um, which is not immediately intuitive, but essentially it's a, a measure of how easy is it for water to go through the membrane, which makes sense if you look at it, the flux you get per pressure applied, that's, um, you know, that becomes fairly obvious. I'm sorry, I, I meant to update this part and I see now that I've forgotten. Um, so this stuff we already talked about. Um, so don't mind that. But I just wanted to say, okay, this is this is permeability, and that gives us um, some indication of the um, yeah the production per pressure in, in a sense. So, and you can imagine that a a membrane that has large pore size. Um, large pores, you're going to get a fairly high flux given small pressure. And that's that's what we saw last time when we looked at that chart of different particle sizes that we might be trying to remove and the pressure required to operate a membrane at that size. Um, it really was looking exactly th at that where the flux was increasing and the pressure was decreasing with the larger and larger pore sizes. Okay, so with that, I have another example problem for you. Um, I think what I'll do, um, I think we'll, I'll, I'll talk you through it and I'm gonna let you solve this one on your own. Um, but I'll, I'm gonna leave, uh, have slides so that we, we can walk through it. Um, so we can come back to it next time if you'd like. Um, but I wanna uh, describe it and then um, answer any questions you have up front and kind of give this as a uh, sort of a as home study problem. Okay, so operators of a small groundwater cleanup operation decide to implement a cross-flow mic microfiltration membrane unit as a pretreatment step to ensure the groundwater does not contain large particles which may clog other treatment steps. Uh, the system must treat 200 liters per hour. Uh, it utilizes a membrane with a pore size of two micrometers. It must recover at least 95% of the water. The influent contains 30 milligrams per liter of particles, and the membrane rejects 80%, 85% of the particles. So the first portion is asking us to label the feed, permeate, retentate streams on the diagram. Um, so done this um, a few times so just keep in mind this dot dashed line is representing the membrane so whatever is passing through that is going to be the permeate okay so that's part a part b is what is the concentration of particles in the permeate stream okay so we were given some influent water concentration so that's going to be our cp we are told that we have some recovery rate of 95%. So if you remember from the beginning of the lecture, this is going to be lowercase r recovery. So that's on the water basis. And then we have the 85%. That's our uppercase r. That's our solute basis. Um, removal efficiency, right? So we've got three t important terms there. We also have this must treat this much water. Um, and this this here can um, could get confusing because if we were treating wastewater and we just had to take care of that much water and that was that, um, we have to meet that demand of how much water we have to um, have to treat, then this would be the Q in the feed. But 
the system said that we've got a uh, groundwater cleanup, um, microfiltration. Uh, we are making sure that the groundwater does not contain large particles, may clog the next treatment steps. Um, so here, I could kind of see it either way, the way it's worded, um, but we'll say that's the QP. Um, and that would be a, you know, if you, if you were thinking about that and weren't sure on an exam, you're welcome to, to ask me about that. Um, I'll try to make sure it's clear if I'm writing a new problem. Um, but this goes back to the question from earlier. Uh, you know, how do you determine that? It really kind of matters about what, how the system is set up. Okay, but then with, with those inf pieces of information, you should be able to have, um, uh, get a good picture of the concentration. Um, and also, if you, if you declare that's the Q in the feed and then do all the calculations accordingly, in this problem, you should be able to uh, solve for the other pieces either way it goes. Um, so that shouldn't end up mattering. You should get a answer that is very close to, if not the same, um, had you done it one way or the other. Okay, so then part C is what is the concentration of particles in the retentate stream? And last, uh, if the membrane is rated for a flux of 25 liters per square meter hour, what total membrane area is required to meet the flow demands? All right. So I'm going to leave you with that, and maybe I'm going, you know, I think what I'll do is I'll modify this a little bit and give this to you as a homework problem. That way I can, we can go ahead and answer any questions you have. I can get you going in the right direction. Um, but you'll have essentially this, uh, maybe, maybe a few changes on the homework. <coughs> uh, yeah, so then next time we'll start on disinfection, and I'm happy to, to help you along with this problem if there was... Uh, any issues. All right, so if that's, unless there are any questions, we'll see you guys on Thursday.